This is part three of the lectures on Protista. Let me just um, get the slides going. And um, we have left off on this page. Um, I'm not sure if I explained what bioluminescence is. Um, bioluminescence is, I, I've seen it before. Um, you, you have to be like, um, you have to be outside, you know, like on a pier or something in complete darkness. And you can look down in the water and you can see little um, microorganisms glowing. So there are enough of them sometimes that, and they, they usually you find them, you know, near to the land, you know, closer to the land. So, um, because in the shallower waters, you know, the, the microorganisms can get more sunlight and all that. So, and there's just um, more nutrients and things. Um, the water's warmer, that kind of thing. So, um, bioluminescence has been used by um, aircraft before to guide them, you know, uh, guide them into land whenever, um, in cases where they were lost, um, you know, um, and they didn't have any, any other way of telling where, where the ocean ends and the land begins, you know. Um, but anyway, that bioluminescence is the same thing you see in jellyfish, but um, it is caused um, by dinoflagellates and some other microorganisms. Um, and then also I mentioned that there's a type of dinoflagellate that causes red tides, especially when you have a particularly overly warm um, ocean water, um, the dinoflagellates can kind of overgrow, they can, they, they can overpopulate. And when they do that, they release this red toxin and the, um, the mollusk will eat it, uh, they will consume it because they're consuming plankton, you know, that's their diet, uh, they're filter feeding. So clams and oysters and, um, you know, other um, organisms in the ocean will consume the plankton. And then um, what happens is that toxin actually builds up a higher concentration. Let's say there's a fish that eats clams or, well, an octopus or something like that. Um, but, but the bottom line is there's, let's say that there, um, it gets higher up in the food chain um, to the fish that humans eat. And um, what happens is the toxin actually gets more concentrated um, the further up the food chain that you go. So it would be more concentrated in the human than it is in the clam, you know. So whenever this happens, whenever red tides occur, um, they uh, stop all fishing and, and um, all shellfish, you know, people who fish for um, shellfish like clams and oysters, they um, stop it so that, you know, nobody will get sick because it's, it's very toxic to humans. All right, so we're, let's see. Um, the alveolates, we had the example of the dinoflagellates, and we're going to talk about the ciliates right now in a minute, but I wanted to mention to you the AP complexins because they're not in the slideshow until the end of the lecture. Um, one example of an AP complexin is called Plasmodium falciparum. I'll spell that for you. This is the protozoan that causes malaria. So it has a two host. It has a, a human host and it also has a mosquito host. But it's called Plasmodium falciparum and um, it causes malaria. You've probably heard of the disease malaria, um, especially common in Africa. So um, the third group from the alveolates are called ciliates. We've already seen a paramecium. Uh, the paramecium is covered with cilia. And not only is it covered with cilia, but it is surrounded by a pellicle, which is sort of like a shield of armor, but it still allows them to move. It still allows flexibility. And here is an illustration of a paramecium showing you just how complex it is. Um, if you notice, 
the paramecium has a mouth and that's for ingesting food and it also has an anal pore for excreting waste and um just so you understand there are animals that only have one opening and that one opening is for food and waste they don't have a separate mouth and anus so this kind of makes the paramecium a little bit more complex and um you know than a lot of um, protozoans and even some animals so another thing that another structure that paramecium have is a contractile vacuole because basically here's your paramecium i'm not a very good artist but something like that <laughs> inside the paramecium you have a, a very low salt concentration but it, there is some you know there is some salt in the fluid um inside the paramecium and outside, it lives in flesh, fresh water, not flesh, fresh water. So it's almost a 0% concentration of salt. So that its environment is hypotonic. You may remember that term from Bio 111. Hypotonic solutions, if a cell is in a hypotonic solution, it tends to take on water. Water moves from the lower um, salt concentration to the higher salt concentration. And so as it takes on water, if it doesn't have a way to get rid of that excess water, then it's going to burst. And that is what the contractile vacuoles do. It's misspelled here, vacuole is misspelled. But anyway, um, that's a little bit about the paramecium. And this is the life cycle of the paramecium, which is pretty interesting. Um, it does not have a male and a female, but it does have two different mating types. So a paramecium can simply reproduce by asexual reproduction, divide by binary fission, just like a bacterium or similar to a bacterium. But it also can undergo sexual reproduction. It, it's actually called conjugation. They will line up side by side. You can watch them, you know, you can watch them do this. If you have a sample of pond water and a microscope, um, if you see two paramecium lined up side by side, like you do in this picture, that's what they're doing. Um, so anyway, uh, instead of having male and female, you have different mating types. And the different mating types are determined by, they have a different type of micronucleus. Now, most of the C1 is blue, the one on the left is blue, the one on the right is red. That's just to let you know that they're different. Um, and as long as they're different, that means they're genetically different, which means if they exchange genes, you can have a different variety in the offspring. And that's, of course, that's one of the main purposes of sexual reproduction is so that you can have genetic variety in the offspring. Um, so the paramecium has a macronucleus and a micronucleus. Each one has a macronucleus, which is big, and a micronucleus, which is small. So what happens is they, the two different mating types line up and their micronuclei reproduce. And so they reproduce, um, divide until there are four haploid micronuclei. Three disintegrate. So these three that are light colored, they disintegrate. The ones that are left divide again by mitosis. And then what happens is they, um, they swap. They swap micronuclei. And that's where the exchange of genes comes in. And when they, um, when they swap those micronuclei, that's step four, um, what you're seeing in step five is just one of them, the one that ended up with the blue micronucleus. All right, so for each um, for each of the paramecium, what happens next is the micronucleus divides three times by mitosis. So that's going to give you eight micronuclei. Four of them fuse and become a macronucleus. And that's step seven. And then um, that macronucleus uh, divides and becomes four macronuclei. So it, and basically what you end up with, is you end up with a paramecium that has four micronuclei and four macronuclei. And that one divides by cell division 
into four daughter cells, each having one macronucleus and one micronucleus. And these should be blue because these are blue, but that's a, just a mistake in the, in the drawing. All right, um, so moving on now to the straminopiles. Remember the chrome alveolates is the supergroup that we're talking about. And the subgroups are alveolates, which we just studied, and now the straminopiles. So the straminopiles include um, diatoms, golden algae, brown algae. Um, there are several different types. So um, one example, um, just a typical straminopile does tend to have one flagellum that is hairless and one flagellum that has hair. So diatoms, I've mentioned these to you before, diatoms have a two-part glassy shell. The glass is silicon dioxide, which is the same. You may have heard that glass is made from sand. Um, that's the same chemical composition of sand as silicon dioxide. This is how you write the chemical formula, silicon dioxide. Okay, um, so that is the chemical composition of the shell. It's a glassy shell, and it's a two-part shell, kind of like, um, you know, a box that you um, wrap up presents. You, well, say you give somebody a shirt for Christmas, and they, you put it in a box. The box has a smaller bottom that the shirt goes in, and then it has a larger top that fits over it. So a shoe box is the same way. You may have even seen a hat box before, although they're kind of old-fashioned. But the point is, they all have a two-part shell. Um, petri dishes that are used to grow bacteria. Petri dishes are round, and they have a smaller bottom, and then they have a larger top that fits over it. That's how the diatom uh, glassy shell is. It's a two-part shell. And they have different, um, different shapes, different colors. They look really beautiful. This is just a picture taken under a light microscope. Um, so they look really beautiful when you get images under the light microscope. But they are part of plankton in the ocean, marine plankton, and they are photosynthetic. They're unicellular and they're photosynthetic. Um, whenever there are lots of nutrients available, diatom populations can bloom. That means bloom just means grow, um, excessively grow. So the excess diatoms die, sink to the seafloor where they're not eaten. And so um, they've built up carbon dioxide through the process of cellular respiration. Um, I'm sorry, they've built, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. It, it can be that way, but it, it, this, this carbon dioxide is carbon dioxide they consumed before they were able to complete photosynthesis. So they have carbon dioxide built up in their bodies and that carbon dioxide is not returned to the atmosphere. So it can um, build up in the ocean, which is not a good thing. Um, golden algae um, just have uh, the, what makes them golden is the pigment carotenoid, which is the same orange pigment that you find in carrots. Um, that they are found in freshwater and marine environments, and they can, they're mostly unicellular, but they can form colonies. But golden algae are also part of the plankton community. Brown algae can be multicellular. They're mostly multicellular. Um, for the most part, the brown algae are what we call seaweed, and giant kelps are an example uh, any kelp is an example of a brown algae, um, but there are giant kelps that grow 60 meters tall. Um, and the kelps are very closely related to plants. In fact, their life cycle involves a sperm and an egg, and it also involves a male gametophyte and a female gametophyte, which are haploid structures that produce the sperm and the egg. And this is really close to what we're going to see in plants whenever we study the life cycle of plants. So they're very closely related to plants. And then here are the OOMICTs. I told you before I wasn't sure, um, but they are definitely um, protozoans and I'm running out of time. So I'll come back to the OOMICTs in the next lecture.